For the hottest arcade games in town, come to Toys R Us. Sega's new Genesis system with 16-bit graphics processor, controller, and Altered Beast game, just $289.99. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Ultimate Sega Genesis Review here on Player One Start. In the previous videos in this series, we took a look at some of the history as well as the graphics and sound and some of the hardware revisions and accessories. Today we're finally going to start diving into the gameplay starting with the launch games. Let's go ahead and get started. The Sega Genesis launched in North America on August 14, 1989, officially bringing the United States into the 16-bit gaming era. Sega beat every other 16-bit console to the market, hoping to build up a following before any other console made it to market. Sega knew it had done well with the hardware, as they had built a reputation of building some of the most graphically impressive hardware in the arcades throughout the 1980s. The design of the Genesis is also impressive, especially when compared with the market leader Nintendo. Sega wanted the hardware to have a more advanced look, beyond just a simple kid's toy. This made the console look more like an electronic appliance with its volume control slider and thinner black case design. Side by side, it would appear that the Sega would be the clear choice for the next generation of gamers. The launch of the Genesis was not without its challenges. Thanks in part to Nintendo's stronghold on the North American video game market, Sega was forced to develop all of their launch titles themselves. Since they were unable to build up much of a following with the Sega Master System, Sega was hard-pressed to bring recognizable titles to market. Sega did have some hit games in the arcade, though, and at the time, bringing the arcade experience home was the ultimate goal for many gamers. For these reasons, many of the games at launch for the Sega Genesis are home ports of Sega's most popular arcade games. However, also noted in their launch titles was their strategy to include recognizable brand licenses on their games. All in all, the Sega Genesis would have six launch games, with a few more trickling out before the end of 1989. In terms of game genres represented at launch, there are two arcade action beat-em-up style games, three flight shooting games, and one sports game. And while this launch lineup may appear small in some respects, this was actually a pretty respectable number for a launch lineup in 1989. And as we start to play through the games, I thought it would be appropriate to start out with the games that was everyone's introduction to this system. Starting with the pack-in title, Alter Beast. Rise from your grave. Altered Beast is a side-scrolling beat-em-up game with light platform elements. The player can kick, punch, and jump. Up to two players can play at once. Each player controls a centurion, fighting undead creatures and monsters in a setting resembling ancient Greece. Upon defeating one of the enemies, a blue ox in this version, the enemy releases a spirit ball, which allows the player to power up. Power up! After collecting three of these orbs, the player turns into a beast, each with their own unique ability. After reaching this power-up, the player can face the end-level boss. Welcome to your doom! However, the boss will also appear regardless of whether or not the character is transformed if the player takes too long to complete the level. Upon the boss's defeat, Neff appears and removes the transformation orbs, and then the next level begins. Though this game was well received in arcades, this home port was actually met with large criticism, with some calling it one of the worst games produced for the console. In my opinion, while this game provides a classic arcade beat-em-up style that was prevalent in the 1980s, I feel that this game does not really show what the potential for the Sega Genesis could be. 
And although some may find this game nostalgic for its inclusion with the original Sega Genesis, I find the sound effects of this game to be quite annoying, and often I find myself turning the volume down. I would recommend this game to people who are nostalgic for the Sega Genesis, especially in its early days. But for someone just starting out with the system, I would say this one is a hard pass. Altered Beast made an appearance in the television series Parker Lewis Can't Lose, as one of the characters becomes addicted to video games and is seen playing and having nightmares about the Sega Genesis version of Altered Beast. In 1993, Matthew Sweet named his album Altered Beast after the game, and most recently, Neff's Rhinoceros Man makes a cameo in the 2012 Walt Disney Pictures film Wreck-It Ralph. Moving on to Last Battle, this is a side-scrolling action game that is similar to its predecessor, Black Belt. The player must fight against enemies using punches and kicks. The player can attack while standing, jumping, and crouching for a total of six basic attacks. In addition to the life gauge, the player has a power-up meter that will gradually fill as he defeats enemies. When the meter reaches a certain point, depending on the stage, the player will transform into a super-powered state, allowing him to perform rapid punches and kicks for the rest of the stage. The game's levels, with the exception of the boss battles and maze stages, feature a time limit in the lower right corner of the screen. But unlike other time limits, instead of killing the character immediately when it reaches its end, it will gradually drain the player's life gauge until the player completes the level. This game is actually based on the manga series Fist of the North Star. However, since the international version does not retain the license, the graphics and character names were altered. At the time of its release, Last Battle was panned by critics and gamers alike for its vast difficulty. Again with critics noting that this game does not really showcase what the Sega Genesis is capable of. Again, I think this game is one that you can skip over. That's also because this game is very unforgiving. This game has become very legendary for its advanced difficulty, and this is a game I don't really get into or find really rewarding when I do beat a stage. Again, this game makes an appearance on several lists of the worst Sega Genesis games ever released. Space Harrier 2 is the sequel to the original Space Harrier developed and published by Sega. Like the original, the game involves a superhuman hero who runs and flies towards the screen in a forever distant background on a checkerboard styled ground. The player can hit any button on the controller to cause Space Harrier to fire his laser cannon four shots at a time. The player can alternatively turn on the auto fire option in the game's menu. As the player moves forward, enemies come from behind and from the far distance to attack the character. They can either fire projectiles, or try crashing into him. The player must also dodge large objects in his path, some of which that can be destroyed, such as trees, and others that cannot, such as columns. One hit from any of these items, and the player will lose a life. However, extra lives can be earned by reaching certain point values. There are a total of 12 stages, each with its own end boss, with some stages having mid-level bosses, which can be more easily defeated. Overall, this game is an okay shooter. However, it also still feels like one of those early Genesis titles that does not really deliver a lot of gameplay. Again, I would reserve this game to those who are fans of the console and have played other games on this system, but not to those that are new to this console. Super Thunderblade is the second of the original Japanese launch titles that also launched in the United States, with the first being Space Harrier 2. As in the first game, the player takes control of a helicopter, which is used to attack a group of gorillas. The helicopter itself uses guns and missiles, and can also airbrake. 
As in the arcade version, this game uses different points of view during the entire game. During normal play, and when fighting sub-bosses, the game utilizes a third-person perspective behind the helicopter. However, the camera angle changes to a top-down perspective when fighting bosses. While this game is of the more impressive titles launched for the Sega Genesis, I feel that this game is a little bit off from the arcade version. The game does control well, but the choppy frame rate makes it hard to avoid enemy obstacles and gunfire. While fans who grew up with the system will find this game fun and nostalgic, I feel that new players will see that this game has not really aged well since its introduction, and as such I couldn't recommend it to newcomers. Thunder Force 2 is a scrolling shooter developed by Technosoft and published by Sega for the Sega Genesis. In this game, stages are split into two formats. The first style introduced is a free directional scrolling overhead stage that is modeled after levels in the first Thunder Force game. This game, however, also has horizontal forward scrolling stages, known as side view stages. In the top view perspective, the player must locate the cores of a certain number of enemy bases and destroy them. After this is accomplished, the stage continues in the side-scrolling view, which plays like a traditional horizontally scrolling shooter. After the boss of a side-view substage is defeated, the player moves on to the next stage. Building upon its predecessor, Thunder Force 2 introduced a weapon system that would become a staple for the rest of the series. The player's ship has a default arsenal of weapons which include a twin forward firing shot, or a single backward firing shot, and a bomb shot. By collecting certain items, the default weapons can be upgraded to a more powerful level. Also, the player can obtain a certain number of new weapons with various unique abilities by collecting the weapon's corresponding item. Once new weapons are obtained, they can be swapped out on the fly. However, if the ship is destroyed, all weapons are lost except for the defaults. You can also obtain small pods which revolve around the ship, named Craws. The function of these Craws is to block weak incoming bullets and to provide extra firepower by firing single normal shots. The player may obtain up to two craws at a time, but will lose them when the ship is destroyed. This game was more positively received than the previous launch titles we have already covered. And to tell you the truth, this may be my favorite out of the new launch lineup, although I do prefer later entries in this series to this one. Overall though, this is a game I can recommend to newcomers as well as veterans of the Sega Genesis, especially if you're a fan of the shooting games of the late 1980s. Tommy Lasorda Baseball was the sole sports game to launch with the Sega Genesis. While getting a personal endorsement from the Los Angeles Dodgers manager Tommy Lasorda, this game is actually not licensed by any baseball league, making all of the team and player names fictional. So aside from those that are nostalgic fans of this game, I don't think I can recommend it to players today. I feel that the controls of this game are a bit clunky and are a bit slow and delayed from when you press something on the controller to when it happens on the screen. I do like that they use clear voice samples, and the graphics are the best of the time, but overall this game feels very dated today and doesn't really appeal to me personally, as I'm not much of a baseball fan. Perhaps for this reason, and the fact that they don't have the license endorsement anymore, this game only appeared on the Sega Genesis and has not been re-released to date. After the initial six launch titles the following month, the only game to release for the Sega Genesis was World Championship Soccer. Being another arcade port, this game presents a top-down, simple version of soccer. In terms of gameplay, there are no fouls, substitutions, or strategies. The player must dribble and pass the ball towards one end of the field and try to score by forcing the ball into the opposing team's net. I have to say the most annoying feature about this game is that you cannot choose which player you are, rather the computer automatically selects the player that is closest to the ball. This leads to some particularly frustrating moments that made me throw the controller down in anger and walk away from this game very quickly. When combined with the dizzying graphics of the field scrolling up and down very closely, I didn't particularly enjoy this game.
In October, two new games would release, and although one is a fairly forgettable golf title, the other was a much-anticipated arcade port from a third-party developer. In Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf, although his name and likeness is on the title screen and the box art, the gameplay actually makes no reference to him whatsoever. The game itself features two gameplay modes, Tournament and Practice. Tournament mode consists of 12 rounds, each with 18 holes, and it does take quite a while to get through. The rounds alternate between the three different golf courses available, one in the United States, Japan, and one in Great Britain. However, the background scenery does not change between golf courses. As the player progresses through tournament mode, their skill level is increased, allowing them to hit the ball further and with greater control. They can also upgrade their golf clubs from the initial black carbon club set to a glass fiber and ceramic clubs. In practice mode, one or two players can compete in 18 rounds of golf one-on-one -on, -one on any of the three courses. Each player can also set their skill level and use any of the three golf sets available in the game. Before each turn, the player's caddy will give advice based on skill level. At first, the caddy can only give the distance from the ball's current position to the tee. As the game progresses, more skilled caddies can give distances to various landmarks and information about how the ball is lying. Controlling the golf swing was actually something that took a little while to learn. To control the swing, the player must use a power gauge to select the strength and height of the shot. When the player first presses the shot button, a marker shoots upwards to the top of the gauge. If the player hits the shot button before it reaches the top, this controls how hard the shot will be. Then the marker will move back down towards the starting position. The player must hit the button a third time inside of the green area on the power gauge, which controls how high the shot will go in the air. If the player fails to hit the shot button a third time, the sequence will start all over again from the beginning. Overall, I had a fairly decent time with this game, although nowadays this game is severely dated, and I think I prefer the later golf games, or more modern ones, than any games of these earlier designs. Some interesting notes about this game is that there are actually connections to other Sega franchises in this game, one being Opa Opa, the player character from Fantasy Zone, is the cursor in the pause menu. Alex Kidd also makes an appearance in the coffee break section after nine holes have been played in each round. The port of Ghouls and Ghosts to the Sega Genesis was one of the most anticipated games of 1989, releasing close to the height of the popularity of that particular series. The game itself takes place three years after the events of the last game. Monsters and demons have returned, and a beam of light has struck through Princess Prin Prin, taking her soul. Now it's up to the Knight Arthur to defeat the evil Lucifer and restore the souls of Prin Prin and the people in her kingdom. The gameplay for Ghouls and Ghosts is very similar to that of Ghosts and Goblins. The player controls Arthur, who must advance through a series of eerie levels and defeat a number of undead and demonic creatures in a quest to restore all the people killed by Lucifer and bring his beloved princess back to life. Along the way, Arthur can pick up a variety of weapons and armor to help him in his quest. While the core gameplay remains the same as its predecessor, the game now allows Arthur to fire directly up and fire directly down while he's in midair. By jumping in certain spots, players can cause a treasure chest to erupt from the ground. By firing his weapon at the chest, players may uncover new weapons, gold armor, or an evil magician that changes Arthur into an elderly man or a helpless duck. This game offers classic old-school platforming, but also classic old-school hardcore difficulty. Again, as in the first game, one hit will shatter his armor, and the second hit will cost your life. Thankfully though, in this home port, there are many checkpoints and continues are unlimited. Nevertheless, it will still take hours before you can successfully complete this game. Overall, an experience I would definitely recommend on the Sega Genesis. Closing out the year and the decade of the 1980s, the Genesis would almost double its library in the final month.
Forgotten Worlds is a side-scrolling shoot-'em-up game by Capcom, originally released as an arcade game in 1988. In this game, the player controls a flying soldier armed with a rifle with unlimited ammo. The player starts out initially by shooting off to the right. However, you can use the A and C buttons on the controller to rotate around the gun. The player can use the D-pad to move the character around the screen, and can choose to move the gun at the same time or just keep shooting in the same direction. This makes the game a little bit more faithful to the arcade version, however there are two stages missing from the home port. Overall, this game received positive review from critics and is still fun to play today, especially since most other scrolling shooters do not allow you to shoot in all directions. Rambo 3 for the Sega Genesis is different than some of the other ports for other systems. While the Sega Master System version is a light gun rail shooter, the Genesis version, in contrast, is a top-down view shooter on its own. Throughout six missions, each with various objectives, the player needs to find the exit, sometimes while freeing prisoners or destroying enemy ammunition supplies while using one of several weapons. The default weapon being a machine gun that never runs out of ammo, he can also use a knife for close range kills, set off time bombs, use his famous longbow with explosive arrows, although the latter weapons are limited in ammunition. This game, however, is incredibly difficult, especially since there's a one-hit kill, and not that many lives to start out with. Overall, it's not a bad game, but it does leave me wanting something more like an Akatra game. Super Hang On is a motorcycle arcade racing game released by Sega, and the sequel to the acclaimed Hang On. This game is a very faithful recreation of the arcade game in the home, and was very well received at the time of its release. Although I will note that the game is very challenging, and will take several tries to beat in arcade mode. That is mainly due to the fact that there is a very low margin of error in races, and sometimes it's even possible to run out of time in a race, even if you haven't slowed down or crashed. But that didn't stop me from trying to get through each course on this game, and I would definitely recommend this as one of the better racing games on the Sega Genesis. If I had one criticism of this game, it may be the fact that it is only single player. Truxton is another vertically scrolling shoot 'em up arcade game that was developed by Tao Plan and later ported to the Sega Genesis. Like all vertically scrolling shooters, your goal is just to survive until the end of each stage while eliminating as many enemies and bosses as you can. Along the way, you can upgrade your ship's speed and weaponry, however taking a hit reverts you back to square one. The graphics are ported very nicely from the arcade version into the home console, although I can tell that the aspect ratio is a little bit off as they've had to crop the screen a little bit. Sometime avoiding obstacles and enemies becomes very cramped, I'm assuming that's a direct result from having to shrink the screen down. Overall though, while I enjoy this game, it is incredibly difficult, as most vertically scrolling shooters of the time are. If you're a fan of the genre though, you can't get much better in this game and shouldn't miss it on the Sega Genesis. <laughs> Golden Axe by Sega is one of the earlier hack-and-slash games that were released before the genre really started to take off. This game takes place in a setting that is more befitting of Conan the Barbarian. An evil entity known as Death Adder has kidnapped the king and his daughter. 
He also finds the magical golden axe, and threatens to destroy both the axe and the royal family if the people of the kingdom do not accept him as their ruler. The player must make their way through each stage, fighting off Death Adder's henchmen. These include men armed with clubs and maces, skeleton warriors, and knights. The player is able to attack using their weapon, jump, and cast spells. Along the way, players can collect blue magic potions, which fill up their magic force bars. With the more force bars they have, the more powerful their magic attacks become. Throughout the game, the player can take control of various animals to ride them. Each of these animals have their own unique attacks and can be ridden until the player is knocked off a certain number of times. Golden X was received quite well at the time of its release, becoming one of the first hits on the Sega Genesis. And if you're a fan of the side-scrolling beat-em-up games of the time period, I say you should give this game a try. The Revenge of Shinobi takes place about three years after the first game. The plot essentially boils down to a ninja that has to try to save his bride before it is too late, as well as take revenge for his fallen master. That said, Revenge of Shinobi is a traditional side-scrolling platform game. The player moves the character around with the directional pad, while the A, B, and C buttons are used to perform attacks. One key move in this game is the Somersault, which maximizes your jumping height and allows you to throw eight ninja stars at once in midair. Also in this game, some stages consist of multiple layers, with some levels transitioning from indoors and outdoors, and other levels forcing you to go underground to proceed to the next area. This game was positively received at the time of its release, with many praising the graphics and the musical score by Yuzo Kashiro. Others were not as kind due to the fact that this game is also very difficult. And although I can see a crossover element from this game's copyright screen, I have yet to come across the character mentioned in this game. Overall, this is a solid title, however, I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. Well, there you have it. That is all of the early games that launched with the Sega Genesis. And while these games didn't have the long-lasting impact that Sega hoped, it did launch the console into its prosperous future. As the 1980s drew to a close, Sega would receive more third-party support, which would help drive more sales of the console. Partnerships with EA and developers that were previously restricted to only developing for Nintendo consoles helped to provide more quality titles that were lacking at the console's launch. As we continue making our way through the Sega Genesis library, though, we are going to transition from playing games as they were released to some of the best games from each genre. All right, well, that'll about wrap it up for this video. In the next video in this series, we're going to start taking a look at some of the best games on the console by genre. So stay tuned for that episode, and if you haven't seen some of the other parts in this series, look for the links in the description below. And don't forget, if you like what you see, please remember to hit that like and subscribe button, share with a friend, Remember to transfer me on social media. Let me know what you guys thought about today's episode in the comments below. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and stay tuned because I have more content coming. I'll see you guys next time. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Again, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time.